Well, hello again, everyone, and welcome to another baseball bookshelf conversation. Uh, good news, bad news is that I'm back at work. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is it means I don't have as much time for these baseball conversations as I normally would. Uh, well, not normally. Nothing's normal right now. In any case, uh, this week's conversation is with Andy Cutler, author of The Batter's Box, a novel of baseball, war, and love. As I explain in the review I posted already to the blog and in the video, I usually don't do fiction because I don't feel I'm qualified to comment, I'm not having any kind of real education in creative writing and symbolism, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, but uh, I really enjoyed this one and I think it was a great conversation. And here we go. Andy Cutler, welcome to the Baseball Bookshelf. Great to be with you today. So, uh, as, as most of uh, the people who follow the blog know, I don't usually do fiction because I don't feel qualified to discuss creative writing intelligently. It's much easier to do history or biography or things along those natures because they deal with fact, not fiction. But uh, your book combines two of my interests, World War II and baseball. So uh, when you uh, contacted me, I thought I would uh, give it a shot, and I'm very happy I did. It's a great book. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, so tell us about the genesis of this project. Sure. Well, um, I uh, early in my professional career, uh, I worked on veterans issues in Washington, D.C., and I worked for a senator from Nevada. And we had a veterans advisory group back in Las Vegas, uh, comprised of veterans from World War II up through, at that time, the Gulf War in that time. And uh, I became friendly with one of the World War II veterans, and he was a terrific guy. Um, but when I asked him about his war service, he could never really talk about it. And at that time, I was pretty young, and um, I just assumed that, like many in his generation, he was just very humble and modest about his service. Um, but then one day he handed me uh, a self, uh, self-published memoir that he wrote of his experience. And uh, it was an incredible uh, tale. He was a 19-year-old um, Navy crewman on a torpedo plane off an aircraft carrier. Um, and he was captured by the Japanese. He lost an eye as a prisoner of war. Um, it, really a harrowing experience. Um, and that was the first time that I realized that it wasn't so much um, that he was modest about his service, he just could not bring himself to talk about it based on what he had been through. And of course, he came from a generation that was conditioned not to talk about uh, psychological issues. It was considered weakness back then, or um, and plus the, the stigmas attached to it. Um, and as I, um, over the years, as I uh, came across more veterans and, and heard stories, I learned that this was a, 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 an endearing problem. Um, men who came back from their wartime experience with psychological problems and had troubles, uh, difficulty integrating back into society. So um, particularly at this time uh, period where, where um, there's a lot of observations going on about World War II, we're now in the 75th anniversary of many um, uh, uh, important events. And I wanted to make sure their story was heard as well because I, I, there were literally hundreds of thousands of these men that were affected by the wartime experience. So that's where sort of the, this project started. So that's the World War II aspect. How did you incorporate the baseball aspect? Sure. Well, um, you know, uh, I'm a baseball fan, uh, I, uh, and, I, and I love baseball history. And one of the uh, historical periods that's always interested me for baseball was World War II. And I only had, before I began this project, I really only had sort of a cursory understanding of what was going on with the game in those years. And as I started to uh, read and learn more about it, I, I found it fascinating. Um, what was going on with the game, um, with the backdrop of war, um, particularly when, the, when my story opens in 1942, uh, in, in early June, late May of 1942, we were losing the war. It was a pretty bleak period in America at that point. We, I was Pearl Harbor was six months before. We had lost Wake Island, the Philippines, Guam. We were being pushed back all across the Pacific. There were real concerns about an invasion of the West Coast. Um, not to mention what was going on with the Nazis in, in uh, Europe. So this was a very bleak time, and yet here the game, the show must go on, right? Um, baseball was played. And also interesting to me were the players. Um, I sort of had an impression that many of the players uh, eventually served 
and the game was um, a bit diminished at that point. But even that I found fascinating. Um, very few players volunteered for service in the first year or two of the war. Um, we know some of the more uh, higher profile ones, Hank Greenberg, Bob Feller, Ted Williams, of course, uh, but most did not volunteer and those that did were uh, kept out of uh, combat zones for obvious reasons. Uh, these were American icons. So the notion that um, any of them could be killed or captured was just unfathomable. Um, and really it wasn't until the later years of the war, um, beginning in late 1943 and then 1944, when most of the players began uh, enlisting, like uh, Joe DiMaggio is a good example. He was uh, jeered for some time for not serving. There were famous pictures of him in his army uniform. Um, and most of those players, like I said, they, they played in exhibition games. Um, they uh, went on war bond tours, but there were that small handful that actually served in combat. And um, I thought that that would make a great protagonist for my book uh, to put uh, a gentleman like him in um, show him before, during, and after the war. One of the things I've been doing during this pandemic uh, is a lot of uh, searching for just different things about baseball. And I found out Baseball Digest is offering uh, free access to their archives, which go back to the early 40s. So I was just bopping around the early 40s and they had sections about baseball in the military and they were talking about you, you mentioned the players who didn't serve active duty but went on these promotional tours and baseball tours and they were saying how important that was to for the morale of the soldiers that they visited that to be able to see these major leaguers in action and to, to be that closer to them than they could ever be and have them go around and, and chatting with them was a big morale booster at the time no question. And, and um, you recall there's a scene in the book early on where uh, a public affairs officer with the army is trying to convince uh, my, my main character not to serve. And he's, trying, he's, he's pre presenting a pretty compelling argument that um, he would do more good, um, uh, you know, stateside, um, boosting morale and, um, and reassuring Americans about the war than he would in a foxhole in Europe um, as just one soldier. So it's a pretty compelling case, but um, I think, and I, I suspect most of the players who did uh, want to serve in combat probably heard that, had, probably had that conversation with someone along the way, but insisted on serving where they did. Well, especially the superstars like Feller and Williams. Uh, and Williams, of course, served twice. He also served in, in Korea. Uh, talk a little bit about the research you had to do for this book. I mean, you had the two fronts. You had the World War II research and the baseball research. Was one easier to deal with than the other? Yeah, actually the, the World War II research was, was um, I would say the material was more accessible. I was a little surprised. Um, I didn't find a lot of uh, source material out there about the war years and um, I, I did eventually find it. It was just a little, the digging was a little bit more extensive to find. For baseball? For baseball, correct. Yeah. Um, you know, I, in terms of uh, accounts of various players, of course, we know the famous ones, right? I mean, you can, you know, it's pretty easy to, to discover uh, Ted, Ted Williams' career path, but you really go into that second tier of players, um, and that's where I discovered uh, a Washington senator that I had never heard of named Cecil Travis, who uh, was an all-star shortstop for the, for the senators in the late 1930s. Um, he volunteered, he, he also volunteered right after Pearl Harbor, served at the Battle of the Bulge, um, tried to resume his career at the end of the war, but, uh, but, but it didn't work out. But he was much older. He was in his, I think, early 30s when he went off to war. And of course, he was away from the game for five years. But I had never heard of Cecil Travis until I started digging around for him. The World War II material was much more accessible, and, um, but, but probably the most important part of that research was my travels to Belgium. Um, where uh, the middle part of the story takes place. Um, and that's the Ardennes region of, of southern Belgium, uh, where the Battle of Bulge occurred. Um, just walking that ground um, really enabled me to visualize um, the battlefield. And really, I really wanted to put my readers right there um, in that terrain. And, um, and, and walking that ground, and I also had a number of conversations with villagers um, who were there at the time, or whose, I, I should say, their descendants were there at the time, their families. I mean, these are small villages, maybe 60 or 70 residents per village. Um, so the families have been there for generations. And um, that was a fascinating part of the research. Um, 
so that was, I really, I really enjoyed my travels out there. Um, I also had a, a number of people who were helpful to me along the way, but I should say the most important part of the World War II, or the war research that I did was talking to veterans who have similarly suffered uh, psychological duress and, and um, problems after they came back from war. I had a number of people who were willing to open up with me and um, that was incredible to listen to. And I tried to use a lot of the examples I heard in my story um, to really make the reader understand what Will was going through when he came back in 1946. So that, it, was, it was pretty comprehensive research. So Will Jameson is uh, an up and coming all-star character for the Washington Senators uh, who decides that he wanted to serve his country, as you say, against the wishes of, of the administration and the military uh, and go serve actively. The, the scenes in which he is active, in which he is fighting are, are truly harrowing. Yeah, like I said, it was my goal. I wanted to put you in that foxhole with him looking down those rifle sights and feeling the artillery bombardment and, um, and, and really the sights, the sounds, the images. Um, I knew going in that, that having that resonate with a reader was critical to understanding Will when he comes back. Um, you, 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 I think to, um, to sympathize with him and to understand what was going through his thoughts and in, in his mind in 1946, you really needed to feel and hear everything that he experienced in 1944. And, and, and that's what I was trying to do. I should say that story though, that where he is, that's a very true story. This is a novel and it's largely fiction, but um, everything that happened in that village of Noville is fact-based and many of those several of those characters such as his commanding officer William Desbury were real people um, so the story itself is fantastic and um, I heard that on one of my travels out to Belgium um, if you are a uh, band of brothers watcher oh, yeah. um, you're probably my favorite. Okay. okay well you're probably familiar then with the uh, the best own episodes yes, which sir. are incredible um, no, so those should, those feature. That's a that's a fairly well known story of the 101st Airborne, the paratroopers that were thrown into the fight because they were the nearest um, at the time, and they were under equipped and underdressed and and um, um, and, and way outnumbered. And so that's an incredible story. But my guide out there uh, told me that to understand what happened in Bastogne, you also had to understand what happened with another unit called the 10th Armored Division. And that's when I heard um, several stories about the 10th Armored, including Noville. And I, I just knew I had to incorporate into that into my story. So, but it's an incredibly compelling, gripping story of what happened in 48 hours in that village. And uh, I wanted to include that in my story. So I, I, I must confess, I am, I'm certainly no Rand McNally when it comes to geography, but Noville is in Belgium. Correct. Okay, Correct. so I have to go change that on the blog because I have it in France. <laughs> oh, well, it's all, it's, it's very, I mean, this is Europe, right? So it's, it's, everything is in pretty close proximity. You had southern Belgium, um, you had France, and you had Luxembourg and Germany, and that's all within probably 60, 70 miles of each other. Um, it was right in that corner. Uh, so it's, it's easy to get tripped up a little bit by the geography. Is Foy also in Belgium? Uh, it is. So you had um, Bastogne. Yeah, Bastogne is the uh, critical town in southern Belgium where the Band of Brothers episode took place. Um, that, I think, was a town of about ten to 15,000 residents at the time, maybe less. Um, and then it had its surrounding villages. So the first immediate village outside of Bastogne is Foix. It's pronounced Foix. I've been, I get corrected on that every time I go out there. Um, is Foix, which is a couple miles down the road from Bastogne. And a couple miles down the road from Foix is Noville. So I, I wonder, you, you mentioned Band of Brothers, which is my, one of my favorite series, uh, unfortunately, because it, it, it's such a horrible thing to, to have to watch. But uh, I wonder, because they say Foy, and I wonder if they do that deliberately to show how ill-equipped the Americans were to deal with the culture over there. <laughs> but you mentioned that you, you incorporate real-life characters, obviously. Uh, you have, uh, when he comes back after the war, and he's playing in games there are like newspaper accounts that use his name along with the names of the regular players and uh, i'm not going to give any spoilers but bob feller plays a very crucial role in uh, will jameson's uh therapy shall we say how 
do you decide to make the real life character that incorporated into the story? Um, well, there's, there, there are two reasons why I picked Bob Feller to, and use that as a device. One, for fun. He, he was my father's childhood hero. My father's from Cleveland. Um, and, uh, and then when I uh, started reading about him and read what a fascinating individual he was, um, you know, in terms of he's just this charismatic, incredibly talented, gifted uh, player, um, I, I thought he would just be sort of an interesting character to write. Um, but more importantly, um, he, one thing I learned in talking to these veterans um, who have come back um, with psychological conditions is that they're really only able to open up to other veterans. Um, they have enormous difficulty talking to their family members, close friends, even professionals. Um, but those that, that they feel have a shared experience, it comes much easier. So um, as we know in the story, Will has tremendous difficulty talking to his love interest about this. He completely clams up, doesn't want to share anything with her. Um, he has some conversations with some professionals. Again, it's difficult. But Bob Feller was, um, as we know, Bob Feller served on a battleship uh, in the Navy during throughout the war um, in a combat zone. And um, he represents that person that will feels a bond to and a special bond to and feel that he can actually open up with um the tricky part in in bringing a character like that to life is i i needed to, to have some fidelity to who bob feller was i had to really be careful that i understood where his service was what his wife's name was what his personality was um i really didn't want to um uh take anything away from his lifetime and, and his own exploits. So um, that took a little bit of work, but I, I really enjoyed that part of the book. I, I'm, I think it probably comes out in the pages, how much fun I had with that chapter. But as you said, it's a really important chapter in understanding sort of the emotions that these men were experiencing when they came back. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the process. Uh, this book, I would say, is for a very specific audience. It's for people who are interested in World War II and people who are interested in baseball. How did you go about trying to sell the book to a publisher? Sure. Um, well, this is my second historical fiction novel. Um, my first one was a Civil War uh, novel. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a full-time day job. This is, uh, this is a hobby of mine. Um, but I've learned a lot about the publishing business and the publishing process in the last few years. Um, and for a virtually an unknown writer, as you, and maybe you can, maybe you went through this yourself, but it's very difficult to break through. Um, historical fiction is a particularly tough uh, sell for publishers. It's not one of the more popular genres. Um, I probably should have been a romance writer if I wanted commercial success. Um, but uh, you know, the you know period pieces. With the, there are exceptions that break out. I think of something like Unbroken. Um, there are others. All the light we cannot see. Um, but historical fiction is a tough sell, no question about it. Um, in this case, I was extremely fortunate. Um, I was, uh, before I uh, pitched a manuscript to um, the big publishing houses in New York, I wanted to get some endorsements from some notable people. So I queried um, some well-known military, uh, retired military people who were all very gracious in giving me endorsements. But there was one that I, I queried that I thought was kind of a long shot. It's a gentleman named Dale Dye. So Dale Dye is kind of a legend in military circles. He is a uh, Vietnam uh, Marine, uh, Marine captain in Vietnam. And he, and thinking about in the mid-1980s, he started a, a company where he became a military technical advisor to Hollywood. So he worked on uh, virtually every prominent military picture from the last few decades, um, starting with Platoon, um, Saving Private Ryan. He is the one who trained those actors, put them through boot camp, okay. um, and really made sure that that scene at the beginning of Saving Private Ryan when they're on Omaha Beach, he's the one that provided all the authenticity to that scene to make it as uh, real as possible and take away some of the, I think his concern was that Hollywood tends to sometimes glamorize warfare and romanticize it. And he wanted to show what it was really like for the, for the ground soldiers. Um, so he was also very much involved with uh, Band of Brothers. He's actually plays, a, he has a role, he's also an actor. So he's in all these pictures. Um, and he, uh, so I wanted, I thought an endorsement from him would be 
terrific. So I reached out for him. He graciously agreed to read the manuscript and came back at me. And, and I did not know this, but he and his wife have a small publishing company where they're trying to do the same thing for literature that they've done for film and to make uh, stories on, on, in books about war more authentic. Um, so he offered to publish my book. Um, and um, I, I should also mention that in terms of Band of Brothers, uh, one of the actors from Band of Brothers is currently producing my audio version of my book. So I'm very excited yeah. about that. Um, but that was, so I, I think, you know, in many regards, I've been fortunate throughout this whole, um, my whole writing, um, uh, the last few years in getting published. Um, and, uh, but this experience with, uh, Dale Dye and Warrior Publishing Group has been really positive and I'm, I feel you very mentioned the audio book. Has this been an option for a film yet? Uh, no, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to work on that. Um, so I'm first up was the audio book. I want to get that done there. There's been a little bit of demand for that. It's, uh, as you know, audio books are becoming increasingly popular. So mm. want to hopefully get that out this year and then, uh, We'll see what happens out west. The, the, the actor from Band of Brothers who will be narrating, who, who would that be? Uh, Matthew Leach. Uh, he played uh, First Sergeant Talbert. Um, he, oh, sure. Not the first Sergeant near the, he became First Sergeant near the end of the, mm -hmm. uh, near the, end of the run. Um, but I met him, I was out in Belgium in December for the 75th anniversary uh, commemorations of the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, he and another, uh, uh, the actor who played Doc Rowe, the medic from the Bastogne episodes, um, I was on uh, uh, a tour with them, a guided tour with them, and book events, and um, developed a relationship there. And Matthew agreed to do my audio book. So. Doc Rowe, is that Eugene? Uh, yeah, Eugene Rowe, correct. Eugene, correct. The, the Cajun, uh, who was uh, featured in, was he featured in the Bastogne episode or the one after that? Um, the best. Uh, the Bastogne episode was told through his eyes, the meta. But again, it's it's he's not the one who's doing my narration. It's Matthew. Oh, yeah. uh, interestingly, like many of the actors on Band of Brothers, they're English. Um, I'm not sure many yes. people are aware of that. Damien Lewis certainly, uh, fantastic. Yeah. It was the a majority of them. Fantastic performance. Well, we've been talking with Andy Cutler again. The book is The Batter's Box, a novel about baseball, war, and love. Highly recommended. And uh, like I said, you know, usually I don't do fiction, so. Take that that for what you will. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Andy, thank you so much for doing this. Stay safe during this time. And uh, do you have another project coming up? I'm working on my third book. I'm, I'm stepping away from historical fiction, I'm kind of going back to my roots. This is going to be a political drama. Uh, I started my career on Capitol Hill, so I'm going to try something a little different here. Yeah, certainly a, little, a lot of drama up there right now. <laughs> thank you, Andy. Take care. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it. And that was our conversation with Andy Cutler. Tune in again next time. Next up in the lineup is Andy Gaff, author of Lou Gehrig, The Lost Memoir, a brand new book about the Iron Horse. Following that will be a conversation with an old friend of ours, Kurt Smith, author of The Presidents and The Pastime, The History of Baseball and the White House. Looking forward to that one. It's long overdue. The book came out a couple of years ago, but I'm sure it will be a favorite of yours if you're into the history of the game as it is of mine. In the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, please send them to Ron Kaplan's Baseball Bookshelf at gmail.com. And remember to visit Ron Kaplan's Baseball Bookshelf.com for the latest news, reviews, previews, and interviews about the game we love. So long, everybody. Stay safe. Yeah.